Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast that delivers cutting-edge food as medicine solutions for optimal health. Allie Miller is a nutrition expert sought up by the media and America's top medical institutes for her revolutionary functional medicine interventions. From disease treatment to prevention, every episode will empower you with ways to put yourself back in control of your health. Please note, the topics discussed are for educational purposes only. Now welcome, Integrative Dietitians Allie Miller and her co-host Becky Yu. Welcome to episode 213 of the Naturally Nourished podcast. Allie here, and today we will be covering Becky's third trimester, including all of the body changes, developing symptoms, updates, and her preparation to meet the little dude, except that (laughs) the little dude was so ready to come at, what was it, Becky, 37 and a half weeks? 38. Eight weeks and four days. 38 weeks and four days that (laughs) when we were planning to record this, he was still supposed to be in her body. And um, now she's talking to us uh, seven and some weeks postpartum. Yes. Yep. (laughs) I think I was literally putting finishing touches on this episode when my water broke or started leaking. But we'll save that for a future birth story episode, I think. (laughs) Yes, that'll be fun. Yes. Um, And and the the little foreshadowing to that, which was interesting, we had all things planned. Like Uh Becky was doing yoga all the way up until, which I'm sure we'll talk about the importance of movement today. And um, in our dance class that morning, <laughs> her her selected word was fluidity, which I think could have been a contributing factor. Absolutely, because like Too all of the fluids. Um, <laughs> but I'll I'll save that. <laughs> yes. So today we have so much to cover. Uh, we talked about Becky's first trimester all the way back in episode one eighty six, and in one ninety six we covered her second trimester. So definitely go back and take a listen to learn about the different phases and nutrition goals and all of the shifts going on in the woman's body as well as developing babe. Um, And then we will be coming out a little bit more. I know there's been some questions. We have some past podcasts on infertility and trying to conceive and the whole planning and preparation process. Uh, And I believe that we will have some of that coming in the next like 10 episodes or so. So stay tuned for that. Um, But we have so much fun stuff to unpack with all of the new things with new mama. So for past episodes on the topic of pregnancy, I have all of my trimesters documented as well. That's episode 21, episode 25, episode 27, way back in the just double digits. Uh (laughs) (laughs) And then um, we have keto and pregnancy, episode 134 before Becky was pregnant. And then again, 186 and 196 for her first and second trimester. So today will be all things third trimester, bringing it into a strong close. And um, before we do so, let's have a word from Fond Bone Broth. Yes. So we absolutely love Fond Bone Broth. And actually, it was in my uh, birthing center bag. (laughs) I thought I was going to be like sipping on bone broth during labor, but um, (laughs) totally did not happen. Um, But you guys know we absolutely love Fond Bone Broth. They are truly wellness, well-made in their slow-simmered, lovingly tended bone broth blends. Yes, and we love their sourcing. They use organic farms that they partner with, and they use free-range chicken bones, including the feet, so you get that nice gelatinous collagen gut-supporting influence from the L-glutamine and all of the therapeutic amino acids. Y'all know in our YouTube channel, we have a gut series under the Naturally Nourished channel, and we talk all about our favorite bone broths, including what store-bought brands are legit, and Fond is definitely in the highest echelon. They use glass bottles. They use quality ingredients. There's no additives or preservatives. It is like your sous chef in a jar. And what makes them really stand out above the rest is their flavor profiles are just phenomenal. Like I'm able to get women that were drinking wine every night with COVID (laughs) on bone broth in a glass because it tastes so good. And I'm so grateful because this is really helping with their, you know, gastric situation after all the stress that we've been sitting in our bellies. Um, So definitely do yourself a favor and go on over to fondbonebroth.com. Check out all their flavors, and they have their holiday flavors now, which include um, rosemary in one of them. I just got one, um, Nopalito, I think it's called. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Um, so go check out fondbonebroth.com. Use the code AllieMillerRD at checkout, and you will save off of your order. It's AllieMillerRD as your coupon code. 
Yep. That was the only bone broth I could drink when I was nine months pregnant in August. Um. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Because it wasn't really soup season there. Right. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. Now I'm getting into my uh, back stock in the freezer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's the thing about Fond is it's, it's like this light, bright, delicious mm-hmm. elixir. So yeah, definitely. Yep. Cool. Yep. So let's talk about a little bit, Becky, just the logistics of like what's happening in the body as we go into and are rounding out that third trimester. Totally. So I definitely felt like I was pregnant forever and a day and like no time at all. It kind of flies, <laughs> flies by. Um, but third trimester starts at 28 weeks. And this is a time of just literally exponential growth. Um, and also a time to start really preparing for what's to come because up until this point it's like oh there's a baby in me but it's not ready to come out yet and so it's kind of that nesting time and also time to organize your birth plan and and really start preparing for birth so I was you know had my label maker out I was like scrubbing the floors and doing all this nesting stuff and that should have been um, probably an inclination that he was going to come a little early because I was doing all those things (laughs) And uh, I remember, so what, your shower was probably like 34 weeks or something like that? I thought it was like 30, 32, but I could 30, be wrong. 30, 32. July and yeah, this, September. Yeah. Right. Okay. It was the week of my birthday. Okay. Um. <laughs> but you were in the third trimester yep. for sure. Yep. And I remember, I remember um, we were filming still a lot for the YouTube channel and I remember so many weeks would go by and, we, and Becky would be like, I don't think I'm going to get any bigger. I think this is it. Yep. And I kept being like, hmm, <laughs> that's cute. I was like, but don't worry. You'll get a sweat pouch from your belly to your um, upper uterine area that will uh-huh. start to develop <laughs> in your dresses. Uh-huh. And then, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it doesn't happens. help with like August in Texas. I remember sitting outside because obviously all the restaurants were outdoors at that point. I was outside at Uchi and like literally got up from the table looking like my water broke because I was just drenched in sweat from like the waist down. <laughs> so the body's putting, the baby's putting on like a half a pound a week at 30 weeks onward. And that contributes to oh, yeah. a lot of <laughs> sensation and weight in the body yep. and, and not just on the scale, but like that, that feeling mm-hmm. of, yeah. Just like I can't get any bigger and and the space for baby is getting a lot tighter too. So this is when we're really starting to look at, you know, baby settling into ideal birth position, head down around 36 weeks um, and shifting away from that rib cage. So I think we talked in um, second trimester about shortness of breath um, and kind of those trends, but really baby's moving down toward the pelvis to get ready for birth at this point. Yes, and that's where I covered in my uh, either birth story or, you know, we we didn't include, but I'll put it up there. Um, I think I have an entire episode on my natural C-section as well. Um, You definitely have a blog on it. I think you do. Birth plans. Um, But I opted out from ultrasounds after 20 weeks. So, you know, at at 20 weeks, they're still doing like somersaults and flips. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so we had no idea that she was that frank and golf breach at that juncture. So, yes, definitely a lot of movement all the way through there. Yeah. And I remember that being like a big stress point that and the group B strep test, which we'll talk about in this episode, were like my two big things during third trimester that I was really, really hyper focused on was like getting baby in that right position for birth. And the midwives kept being like, baby's going to do it on his own. And he totally did. (laughs) (laughs) And when was your, what were your ultrasounds in the third trimester? Do Um, you recall? did have one right away to confirm oh third trimester yep. i am like Not the all the way back the whole time <laughs> um, so you probably didn't want around like 24 brain. 28 like ending the second trimester or just 20 Mm-mm. um just 20 yeah okay. 20 to um for the anatomy ultrasound um and, and the then second trimester that was second trimester and then third trimester i had it at 37 weeks so that's really oh, that, that point yeah you know where if baby was breached we'd have to do some quick work to flip him mm-hmm. um, but we found out that he was in an ideal birthing position which was fabulous awesome and anything interesting with that ultrasound that like uh well you already knew he was a boy I knew he was a boy um I don't think there was anything else was he sucking his thumb in one of them oh or something? yeah I yeah yeah he had his cool. hands like up by his face so cute he had his hand we couldn't get a good picture of him he had his hands like over his face and Now he's like a very handsy guy where he likes to suck his thumb and Mm -hmm. has already found his hands and can do stuff with them, which is pretty cool. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let's talk a little bit about uh, what's going on neurologically. And um, 
I, do you, I, I don't know. It's not it's not in your notes, but I'm just curious. I remember when I was asking Byron like for the baby shower, the questions of their first sense. And mm-hmm. I know that the first sense that they develop is hearing mm-hmm. because they can hear in utero. Uh, does that start in the third trimester, do you know, or is that even earlier? I think it's earlier than third trimester because we okay. were talking and singing to him. Yeah. And I was reading the week by week um, the Mama Natural Guide, which I thought was a great resource. I think I linked it in prior episodes. Um, but I think that happens more like second trimester. Okay. And then you're seeing all of the other senses and kind of those neural connections developing in third trimester. Yeah. I saw that even the REM cycle of sleep starts to develop, which is like pretty, you know, expanded brain development or uh-huh. dreams. Yeah, and what like, are they dreaming I about? Know. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's just, so cool. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'd love to be in there. Um, and then there's also the structural changes that we mm-hmm. see happening. Yeah, so bones hardening, um, except the skull, which stays soft to allow for that movement through the birth canal. Um, So those plates haven't quite fused together, obviously. Um, And then kidneys and liver are fully functioning by 36 weeks. You've really, by 37 weeks, um, got a fully cooked baby and all organ systems are are a go. And that was the condition of your birth center. You had to hit 37 weeks, otherwise it was, of course, a forced uh, hospital transfer, so... I think that's why you allowed yourself to use the word fluidity because yes. it was September and you <laughs> yep. had done your job. <laughs> yep. And I started having some like false labor right before it was like three days prior to hitting 37 weeks um, where I was having like very intense contractions. Braxton and like, Hicks. yeah, Braxton Hicks, but they felt really different and like had to, we were driving to San Antonio and I had these like shorts on that I literally, I had to take them off and like switch clothes with Byron um, <laughs> and wear a pair of his shorts for the rest of the drive because they were so tight. And I'm like, nope, this baby can't come yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think during this time too, I was really focused on support for just like all of that exponential growth, both of my body and baby's body. Yes. So what were some of the things you were doing topical or food as medicine and supplement? For yeah. That? I used this really nice um, belly butter from um, Slow North. You know that shop Mm -hmm. um, in Austin. But they sell online, so I can link the product. I don't know the brand off the top of my head, but it was like a shea butter, coconut oil, kind of whipped blend. Um, And Byron would actually massage that on my belly just so he would get some, like, connection. I love that. With Babe. um, And he'd, like, talk or or sing. (laughs) One of like the three songs he has memorized, um, not good songs like Green Day or something. <laughs> um, and then I also use the everyday oil pretty much everywhere, literally every day because I was showering sometimes twice a day. Mm, <laughs> it's just yeah. so hot. Um, that everyday oil that we've talked about prior that has like Palo Santo and um, sage in it and smells amazing. And then collagen and gelatin, I really focused on upping those, um, as well as my bone broth that I mentioned fond was really the only one I could do. I wasn't doing like a lot of soups or anything. Um, and I know with the collagen and gelatin, you usually recommend at least stopping it at some point during third trimester. Um, like right before birth, I feel like I've heard you say that before. I totally didn't do that, but just the to... only the only thing I've heard is that, uh, and I'm I'm not gonna think about it right now. Um, the word, but when you birth with the placenta intact, mm-hmm. um, um, and call, it's yes, something and call, I, mm-hmm. and call, right? Yeah, is that 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 increases, which which may mm-hmm. not again it, that can also still be a very healthy option, but it's just that if the placenta was to uh, you know burst in the process, it's not placenta. I'm sorry, the no, amniotic sac, the sac. Excuse yep. me. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> four years ago, not in my brain, but yeah, yeah, not, placenta is separate issue. Yep. Yep. We're not talking about that. Yes, and call in, in the amniotic sac because the collagen has strengthened everything so much, is what right. I've heard. Right, and I've heard it can make it harder for, yeah, your water to break your and, water, yeah. and um, kind of membranes to rupture in the way that they're supposed to prior yeah. to or during. But labor. then for like shoulder dystocia and mm-hmm. some of the other concerns, it would be a positive. Yeah. So I think it's just one of those be intuitive of yeah. what feels right. And I didn't I didn't pull it out just because again he was born a little before. And were you doing <laughs> a lot of gelatin at that time or more just like I think I was doing more coffee? more collagen and yeah. gelatin was more postpartum. Uh, yeah. Thanks to you. That makes sense. That's what <laughs> um, I would go for it. And then supplement wise, I added um, kind of at the end of second trimester going into third trimester, our osteofactors blend. So I was doing 
two upwards of three of those a day just to provide more support for a baby's bone gro- yes. growth. And I was doing a lot of dairy at that time too. We mm-hmm. <laughs> had a whole episode of me musing on ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the MCHC form is just, I mean, I can't tell you how many scores on Z scores and bone density when I'm working with women that are perimenopausal or menopausal and doing bone density scans. It's the combination of getting their estrogen imbalance and also having that MCHC form of calcium. I, I just, it is so fantastic because there's bone derived growth factors in that matrix. So you don't just get elemental calcium, you actually get that whole matrix to actually repair and drive bone growth, which is working against the clock in women that are aging and for developing and growing a baby, there's such a depletion demand. And that's where a lot of women will have uh, period and period, um, uh, oral or um, different dental issues because a lot of times they'll get bone loss Mm -hmm. in their, in their gum line. Um, so really good to be vigilant about that. And I would say even the first probably three to six months postpartum to stay on that calcium supplementation. Yep. I'm still taking it and I'm kind of <laughs> at the point where I'm like, oh, I'm getting to the age where I need to um, keep taking this based on <laughs> right. our past podcast well, on breastfeeding, bone loss. Breastfeeding yep. too, yep. leeches. Yep. So, yep. Yeah. Um, and then I also had added on um, a form of choline, so phosphatidylcholine, um, 450 milligrams a day. And I think we mused on choline quite a bit in the um, episode 186 on first trimester and kind of brain growth. Mm -hmm. Um, But that was something I just really wanted to add on to give him, you know, the best advantage possible in terms of his little brain. Yes, totally. So let's talk about preparation for labor and maybe share a little bit because I don't think you knew exactly, I'm not sure that you shared about like the birth center or details there of like working with a midwife, Mm -hmm. um, to what detail. So let's talk about some of the prep and, and I think you had, you knew you wanted a doula, but I'm not sure that you had selected or met with your doula. All that was in the third trimester, right? already selected her, but I hadn't met her yet because of COVID. Um, she was doing mostly virtual meetings just based on kind of some other clients who were birthing, you know, sooner. And so I don't think I met her until like 32 weeks for the first time. Um, and we had two sessions with her prior to his birth. And then obviously she attended birth and, and we've had some follow-up sessions since. Um, but those were just all about um, kind of getting to know, you know, what would be best support for me we did talk through like some positioning stuff, but she was like, you're going to forget all of this. <laughs> and it's totally true. Um, you know, all of the stuff that we did in the um, birthing class and, and all of the positioning, um, I totally, I forgot all of my cues, but it's great to have a support person who can remind you of all of that. So I was doing the um, spinning babies um, exercises. So a lot focused on position during this time, probably from like, week 28 onward. Um, So it's a lot of like cat cow type positions. Um, One thing that she had me focus on was basically taking your belly button and pretending there's like a flashlight coming out of it and always having that flashlight kind of shining either neutral or down, never upwards, because that helps the baby to get into an ideal position. And when so you're, like tipping your pelvis exactly, kind of back? Exactly, yep, mm-hmm. um, exactly. And when you're that pregnant, all you want to do is like lay back on the couch. And Which, I found myself doing that a lot. So I'm glad that I was able to kind of counteract that. Um, so I did those um, exercises. There were also a series of like lunges to make more room in the pelvis. And I think yoga was a huge help as well just for you know creating space for babe Um, and then I was also doing a lot of chiropractic work and really focused on pelvic alignment during that time Um, so I think all of those things kind of helped in regards to positioning and and kind of setting me up for ideal uh, baby position and was there like with the position things like you said you didn't really have stations or what you had planned to be stations didn't really happen 
or were there some things that you thought you wouldn't like that you did like? I mean, I know we'll go into the birth story later, but I'm just curious. Yeah. Like I always remember when we only did like the birth boot camp thing. I know you, Becky did so many more hours. Like I never read a book. Um, <laughs> I only had my birth boot camp and I was like, I'm good. I got this. My body can do this. And <laughs> Becky and I share a YouTube accounts. So I would see the videos that they oh, were God. watching. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, Byron <laughs> is never going to look. <laughs> I mean, very, I mean, I don't know. I think Brady saw one birth ever in our class. Class, and it looked like you guys watched like 30. We watched maybe, a lot. Maybe 150. Um, <laughs> we watched a lot of birth. And part of that was like part of the uh, the birth class. And part of that was just like it would then play another one. And they're kind of like addictive in that way. Byron's we were like, such a curious like engineer. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. yeah. We would like lay in bed and, and just <laughs> watch them. Um, so that's something I I do recommend if you're preparing for a natural birth, um, but also like know that your birth could look completely different. We watched like some orgasmic birth videos, all kinds of things. (laughs) I'm like, I don't, I don't believe it. You make the same sounds, but I don't know (laughs) that it could feel that great. Uh, But we watched a ton of, of uh, videos to help prepare. And then I also read Ina Mae Gaskin's, um, I think it's called guide to childbirth and that's a lot of birth stories as well. So I think that can be a really nice empowering thing to do is just to, you know, learn from other people's experiences. Um, in terms of like birthing stations, I know you had like a whole circuit Mm -hmm. planned. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think I went that far. I think I went as far as like this is what's available to me. I knew there was a tub and I kind of wrote that into my birth plan that I wanted to labor in the water. Um, and also there was a birthing stool that I did not think I would like, but that ended up being a very useful tool during my birth. And we'll go more into that later. Um, the toilet was one that I knew I wouldn't like, and I did not like, I was like, get me off of here. I will not have my baby on the toilet. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that like spinning babies circuit, both prior to, and then my doula actually came over while I was in labor and did that stuff with me as well. So I'll, I'll link, um, the videos I was using for those. Cool. And then as you were saying, the increase of contractions as you were getting closer, were you making any supplement adjustments at that time? And again, had you envisioned any supplement needs? I don't think you really did, right? We'll go into that in the birth time. But how about, how about the third trimester when you'd have more of the like Braxton Hicks or intensive stuff? Yeah. So, um, I realized like when I was having that false labor that I was probably just a little bit dehydrated. Um, so I really upped my hydration and electrolyte support. I mean, honestly, throughout second and third trimester, I just felt so much thirstier. Um, and it didn't help that again, it was like, you know, July, August, and I was really big and I was still trying to get outside and do all the things. Um, so I used, um, an electrolyte, uh, support that I can link. It's the one that you gave me a freebie of. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I also used relax and regulate a ton and that was helpful both for Mm -hmm. electrolyte. Um, I was having some like Charlie horse cramps. Um, and I think the osteofactors was helpful with that too. Um, and then bowel motility for sure. I really kept like two to three scoops daily of the relax and regulate. Yeah. Let's talk about a little bit of that. So structurally, like we said, at 30 weeks on babies growing a half a pound Mm -hmm. a week. And so that does, you know, we've talked in other episodes about constipation and the connection of both, you know, a woman has a longer colon than a man. And then also the uterine tissue pushes on the colon. Mm -hmm. Um, so that only further is going to create some issues with constipation. Totally. And then the hormonal shifts also, usually that's a little bit earlier on that you start to see that. And I tend probably toward constipation anyway, if like anything drops out of my routine. So like during travel, if I forget my relax and regulate, if I don't drink enough water, my body's like, nope, lockdown time. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was something I was really conscious of, you know, throughout because I just did not want to get hemorrhoids and deal with all that yuck. Um, so I did keep a pretty tight eye on my hemoglobin and hematocrit as well as my ferritin. Um, just in every trimester, I asked to have that run anytime that we were doing labs. Um, really it was just adding on the ferritin because they did a CBC, I think every trimester. Um, and I remember my ferritin being at 33 at 28 weeks, um, which is, you know, on the lower 
end where we probably want it in like that 60 to 70 range. Um, you know, especially that's, that's getting into like danger for hair loss and things like that. And I know that my ferritin was a hundred in that first trimester. So actually quite high, probably from that multi-avail mama that I was taking ongoing. Um, so when I found that out, I started layering on Hemogenics, which is a metagenics iron support that contains um, a chelated form of iron as well as some cofactors. So there's some extra B12 and folate and some other stuff in there. Um, and I started doing that probably like three times a week. So just like every other day, um, because I knew that extra iron could also kind of kick me over into more constipation and I did not want that. Um, and then red meat intake um, really throughout pregnancy after after first trimester because I like did not want protein at all that first trimester yeah Um, my red meat intake was pretty good like I was doing a lot of um winter beef which is this amazing grass-fed wagyu here Mm -hmm. in Austin um kind of spoiling myself with their steaks and also just using their ground beef um also doing a lot of the um organ blend from yonder way farm so like four times a week Um, upwards of of five times a week doing uh, grass-fed beef. Yeah, and the organ blend, even more supportive beyond getting the iron and some of the mineral density, like zinc, you'll get higher Mm -hmm. in there, but we're also going to get then the CoQ10, which is so important for the neurological and cognitive development, and also as a really functional antioxidant, uh, which can be supportive as you're going into the whole oxidative stress process of birth. So I think that's a good good superfood of getting in your organs always. Totally. And I think, you know, the other thing there is, is nutrient density becomes so much more important in third trimester because you can't fit that much in your belly anymore, Mm -hmm. right? With that baby, um, kind of expanding in in size week by week. Um, you're just stretching and there's not a lot of room in your stomach. So I think I was consciously making choices that I knew were more health supportive versus first trimester. I was a little bit more, um, just survival mode. Second trimester, I was a little bit more indulgent, like, Oh, poor me. I'm pregnant. I'm going to eat ice cream. Third trimester was like, nope, we got to get what's best for you, what's best for baby, and pack it in in calorie-dense bites because I honestly didn't want to eat that much um, toward the end. Yeah, I was going to say. Also, I just think that feeling, at least personally, I remember feeling like larger in your Mm -hmm. body that the last thing you want to do is look at food kind of thing, you know, like because you're just like, and and not not like a body dysmorphia fat thing, just like literally physiologically larger, like like bending down to Mm -hmm. tie your shoes. (laughs) All the things that you don't realize that are... Or, you know, influenced in your day-to-day function. And so, yeah, it's like with food. And I think that cravings with blood sugar and all of that, like we talked about first trimester is really when that insulin goes up to stimulate growth. And that's often when we'll see higher carb. And you did start the avocado toast then and stuff. Yeah. Like, and I think all that kind of fell back to more of a tighter carb control third. You're also yep. mindful of blood sugar control mm-hmm. for babe. So all that kind of just goes back into its place. Yep. I totally didn't want as much of the the sweet stuff. I was really focused on savory. I got my organs like once a week and Oh, except for we should muse on your the um shower cake. That oh. was so good. Oh. <laughs> I feel like I wrote about the shower in this episode, but it's been so long since I wrote these notes. Um, oh my gosh, the cake for my shower that Allie got um, from Cafe No Say. It's at the South Congress Hotel here in Austin. They did a gluten-free, was it almond? Like a, like almost mascarpone kind yeah, of take on the, yeah, yeah. the almond buttercream uh-huh, frosting. Uh-huh. And then they did like a fresh strawberry, strawberry jam yeah, layer. Like, mm-hmm. And um, then they took all, it was 12 different edible herbs or flowers. So they had like calendula and like mint leaves and then chocolate mint leaves and oregano. And it was beautiful. It was all, and borage, I think, purple mm-hmm. flowers. Um, yeah, so all, and borage, really great for GLA. And like, uh-huh. yes, yeah, so I just thought it was such a cool thing. It was so, so pretty, uh, so beautiful. And I know you worked really hard because like every, every bakery, bakery was, was shut closed, down yeah. that did gluten-free. Um, like, you're getting chocolate cupcakes. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's all I can make. Oh my gosh. Um, and we, we actually ended up freezing some. And I think I ate a slice like right after baby was born, like the last. That sounds perfect. <laughs> the last piece of it. <laughs> well, because you ended up making him a birthday cake oh, while yeah. you went into labor. I did. I did. <laughs> we'll save that as well. Let's talk about, so the iron, when you brought in the iron, mm-hmm. um, I know we talked a little bit about shortness of breath, kind of more with that connection of both 
you know, the shift of the demands and hemodynamic changes of blood flow more earlier on, mm -hmm. right? But then the rib cage element in the second trimester. So when you brought in that iron, did you feel like that helped with shortness of breath? Definitely. And I don't know if that was coupled with him also like moving, moving. down, mm -hmm. um, but I definitely think that that helped. And also, you know, again, I was walking, but not walking like a lot of, we do have hills in our neighborhood, but I was going, I was going slow at the end there. Um, but I didn't have as much shortness of breath, probably the last like six weeks of pregnancy. Okay. And then let's talk about the topic of masking and uh. pregnancy. <laughs> and I think that you really, of all of what I've seen as opportunities out there, um, I, I know that the midwife uh, practice was mandated masking in your appointments, so in the waiting room, and then also throughout the appointment, or were you able to take your mask off during your appointment, and um, anxieties leading into the, the, the birth and mm. kind of what you were told your yep. options were in that yep. sense? Um, so they did require you to wear a mask throughout the appointment. Um, one thing, I think I got into this in episode 199 on the importance of breath, um, I started to notice my blood pressure going up first at 28 weeks. It was like 145 over 75, which I'm usually like a very low blood pressure Especially person. with your adrenal fatigue uh -huh, history. Uh -huh. like I'm like 110 kind of over 60, person. like a dead person. <laughs> and it just, it was two things. They were using um, like the automated kind of cuff machine when I first checked in. So I had just like walked through a parking lot, come up the stairs, the nurse would call me back and then pop me on this automated machine, which I think was a little bit more, um, finicky and, and, uh, read me a lot higher. Um, so I started to, in my appointments, ask for just 10 minutes in the room by myself so I could take my mask off. And I wasn't doing a real mask mask. I was doing more of a bandana, which allows a little more airflow. Um, but 10 minutes without the mask, just to do some deep breathing to try and bring that down. And I was using a lot of Gabacom during that time too, because I think as soon as I saw that high number, I got into like panic mode of preeclampsia and like, oh my gosh, is this going to kick me out of the birth center? Um, so I think there was that little bit of white coat hypertension happening as well. Um, but I, I definitely think the mask contributed because after 10 minutes without it, I would be able to get down to like 135 over 70, which is still high for me, but that's pretty normal to see that increasing both second and third trimester just right. because your blood volume is, is so much more. Right. Right. Um, and I bought a, a little cuff that I could test at home because obviously like I'm a super nerd. I got that and a um, pulse ox. Pulse ox. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was like, these are good tools just to have and, and play around with. Um, so I was testing my blood pressure daily and keeping a log of that just in case, um, you know, something did come up in terms of preeclampsia. And so that was then all normal. And then you felt like the Gabacalm and CBD helped at the appointments yeah, to kind yeah, of yeah. keep that anxiety and, and that. Yeah. So influence. if I, I took it prior and then if I read high, I would ask for that 10 minutes and I would like dose myself up with a bunch of CBD and Gabacalm and it, it got it down into like the 130 over 70 range mm -hmm. every time. Good. Um, let's talk, and honestly, I think we should share for women that are pregnant now. Um, I think if you had known about that, I, I don't, I'm not going to pronounce her handle, right? I think it's like Celia or something. Um, there's this woman who also speaks about the fact that masks are just virtue signals and, um, it's listen to episode 199 of our podcast, <laughs> the importance of breath. It's a really fantastic one where Becky talks about this. Uh, and, and we share a lot about how the respiratory system functions. And, um, you know, it, it's, again, just really interesting when we take pause and think that it was scientific consensus up through March of 2020 that cloth masks are actually net harmful and do not reduce infect infection rate of a respiratory virus um, and that actually we've seen with healthcare workers wearing ppes for prolonged periods of time and never have really looked at a wor real world model of non-trained individuals especially not to mention children um, <laughs> not to mention essential workers um, and so of course my stance stays very strong that I feel that masks are not just a net neutral something to do to protect others. I think that they are in fact net 
harmful for the wearer and that if you are harming an individual with a mandate that that doesn't protect anyone so um if you know you're of that mindset and it creates more anxiety to virtue signal and it feels inherently imbalancing for your body and that drives anxiety and whatnot um, there are at least now some masks out there that are very breathable and kind of mesh made. And, and this woman's handle is like Celia, but we'll put her link to her website. And Becky just got these like rose colored and like flesh colored, like very thin. Um, they do a double layer of the mesh, but like Brady got two black ones for grocery shopping. Um, so I think that that would be the best option. Would you agree? Versus oh, yeah. the bandana, yep. which, which yes, you get a little bit of breathe away, but still it's such thick material. Yeah. If I had known about mm-hmm. that it, during, yeah, <laughs> during that may pregnancy. have helped. Yep. That may have it, not even yep. hindered then the breathability. Yep. So just food for thought there. Yeah. Cause I was still trying to do all the things. Like I was still going to the farmer's market up until probably... 35 weeks and I would have to like step out and take off my bandana and just let Byron finish the shopping but because was, it's a health hazard I was trying to push through and then there um, is a study that I was sharing with some mamas who were DMing me about it um, of nurses who were pregnant wearing N95 masks did see increased migraines and decreased hypoxia mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. Yep, decreased oxygenation, which is really important for you and your baby. Yeah, I feel like yep. we're kind of past due for another episode yeah. on the topic because things <laughs> continue to stay in a maddening way. Um, because I, I was reading a new research study too that a neurologist put out on uh, hypocampal, uh, like the hippocampus uh, demands for oxygen, and much higher, much greater than can be detected through like a pulse ox, for instance. And especially in children's developing brains, they're so oxygen thirsty. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, this is the time that we really need to start thinking critically and um, protecting our loved ones and making choices that make sense best to us in our households um, for medical autonomy. So moving on from that, sorry, (laughs) sidebar, Um, let's talk about preeclampsia and prevention. Oh, and and just to say, sorry, the thing that got me on it was was laboring. Like I I can't even, and also... Mm. Um, uh, look the first look at your baby oh, yeah. as a mom, uh-huh. as a new mother, without being able to express a smile at them. I don't give a shit. I would tear that mask mm-hmm. off my face, and no one's gonna tell me otherwise. Um, so that's and my piece on that. <laughs> if someone had asked me to put on a mask during labor, I probably would have torn their face off. Um, but it wasn't even literally. I forgot that well, we didn't were. Didn't you walk a- in without pants? Yeah, I had, so, I had no pants, no underwear on. Pants so, aren't required. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, you're not putting a mask on. I didn't even have one with me. Usually, I have a backup one. They asked me to put it on on my way out, and I was like, I don't have one. We're the door's right there. I'm like in a wheelchair, and she's pushing me. I'm like, we can we can make it to the door. Um, but I I was asking at every appointment, and I was trying to you know stay neutral about it when, with the midwives, and they expressed to me early on like we are not going to make you labor in a mask. That is ridiculous. And I got that consensus from all of them. Like you actually need to breathe. We're focusing on breath. We're checking, you know, your blood pressure. We're checking your oxygenation. If you're in the hospital, um, we're potentially giving you supplemental oxygen. So we're not going to have you mask. Um, but I do, I have lots of friends who gave birth during this time. And, you know, I saw their first photos, they had the mask on or, or just pulled down at least so they could look at their baby without it. Um, but that was something I was asking every time, have the mandates changed in the hospital? Um, and they were saying basically that you were required to wear it during triage. So when you came in and then, you know, they weren't going to ask you to put it on again if you took it off. If you pulled it off yourself yep. in duress. Yeah. Right. And, was kind of the thing. stated that you were having a hard time breathing. That's, you know, you just advocate for yourself yes. and not putting that in your face. And they, you know, by that time, they actually can't kick you out or refuse you. <laughs> like, think about yep. this. Mothers used to be put on supplemental oxygen mm-hmm. in labor and not used to. Your, your, right. your midwives do that, right? right? If people get low oxygen. Like, yep. So it's absurd. So all of you mamas, if this is your third trimester, you literally pull it off and yell, I can't breathe. Yep. <gasps> yep. As you're and in I, labor I mean, and it's done. Yep. It's done. Yep. And Byron didn't wear one um, during, and I thought he was going to have to and we had his like backup bandana. Um, but that was something that was very important to me. And I, you know, advocated to him ahead of time, like you rip that thing off your face, your baby's not looking at you with that mask on. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I just kept asking what the the requirements were and the birthing center did not require it at all. Like I said, I had no pants on. So 
<laughs> that's my favorite part. Yeah. Okay. Preeclampsia. Yes. Um, so that was what I was getting concerned with about right. with mm-hmm. the elevated blood pressure. And, and I think maybe let's just touch on a few points of prevention and, and, um, a couple of maybe supplement recommendations here. Um, I know relax and regulate, uh, is a big one that we recommend for any woman who's kind of tending toward that elevated blood pressure. And we've talked about even in our, um, past episodes on, on blood pressure, just in general, not related to pregnancy. Um, but with preeclampsia, you're seeing, um, you know, pregnant women, um, as the only ones that are affected. Um, and this is going to be characterized by high blood pressure, fluid retention. That's why they're asking in all of your appointments, are you seeing any increased swelling in the hands and feet? And the answer in the summer is always yes. Right. Um, but it's more, you'll see like moon face all of a sudden, right. or your feet are like super, super swollen, like can't get a shoe in uh, a shoe on. And then they're also screening every time. Um, I think from like 28 weeks onward, um, doing a urine test, looking for protein in the urine. Mm-hmm. And how often did your, do you, do you have your urine results? Did you always have ketones in your urine or only sometimes, or did they not always screen completely? Cause a lot of your analysis will uh-huh. always screen for ketones as well. Yeah. Um, I'm trying I know I saw it. I, I don't remember seeing it every time, but I know I saw it a few of the times. So I was interested least. if they talked to you about it. Anna. They talked about it in, um, I think it was one of my first visits when I first transferred over to this practice, um, when I started asking right away about the gestational diabetes um, screening and how I could opt out because I just wanted to be really prepared for that. Um, And that's covered in in second trimester episode. Um, But they talked about it and the one midwife that I had um, was like, oh, it's dangerous to be in ketosis. And and she kind of left it at that. And I didn't say that I was practicing a ketogenic diet and I really didn't throughout pregnancy, but I was, you know, testing with ketones, at least during second trimester when I did those blood glucose sticks, I also tested my ketones and I was still, you know, anywhere from like a 0.8 to 1.2, even with the increased, um, carb variants. Yeah. So, okay. So preeclampsia is going to affect those higher that are overweight, especially kind of like with the blood pressure thing and the Braxton Hicks or contractions, electrolytes Mm -hmm. play a big role here. So fluid intake, getting at least that two to three liters of fluid ounces a day, which again, a lot of women, as they get into this third trimester, don't drink as much because they just Mm -hmm. feel like they're peeing all the time (laughs) and they're swollen. So they don't, you know, often they'll hold back on fluid when fluid actually is so necessary to support that renal function, Mm -hmm. that kidney function. Um, so beyond the hydration and trying to maintain a healthy, you know, of course, increasing BMI, but a healthy rate of body weight gain, um, what are some other things that can be done? I think exercise is a huge one. And I would say, you know, trying to get like 30 minutes a day, um, regardless, but definitely when you're pregnant, like I was getting a walk every day and then I was doing our, um, weekly yoga and our weekly dance Mm -hmm. literally up until the day before he was born. Um, and I think that, you know, also helps with stress reduction, especially during this, you know, weird time, um, like having those ways and, and kind of an outlet in your body and, and some stress reduction, um, in terms of yoga and breathing techniques, getting enough sleep is important, which I was sleeping, you know, a good amount just because again, pandemic, like we weren't going anywhere. So I could sleep in quite a bit on my non-client days. Um, and then vitamin D has shown to be important as well. And that's something I was taking. Um, I think I shared throughout and and still am, um, but low vitamin D has been associated with, um, increased tendency toward preeclampsia. Yeah. And, um, that makes sense with that whole blood pressure, kidney connection Mm -hmm. and vitamin D having that connection with production. Uh, and you were doing the vitamin D balance blend Yes. in addition to the small amount of vitamin D in our multivale mama. And I want to make a note, just kind of thinking full circle about the multivale mama when you were taking it, I think your first trimester, you were doing the old formulation mm-hmm. at six capsules a day or wait, was it yeah. six a day? Yeah. yeah. And then you switched, I think probably mid second trimester to like the four capsule a day. And I will say the iron actually mm-hmm. was lower. Yeah. It was less than 18 milligrams in that. So we actually have just reformatted, formatted, 
formulated, goodness, we've reformulated again. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this newer round will have more of the iron bisglycinate, that chelated iron form, which also would mean that likely most women won't need an additional iron supplement towards that tail end with, with a new formulation. So just check the back of your label, women. If you are on the one that's less than 18 milligrams, you may want to consider bringing in like 30 milligram every other day iron in a chelated form in that in that end trimester, especially if your hemoglobin and hematocrit are running it all low. Yes. Yep. And that's kind of why I kept screening for that and, and added in that supplemental iron because I knew I had, yes. I was very happy to only have to take four capsules, especially when there's not mm-hmm. much space. Um, and you definitely get an awesome B blend yes. and we've talked yep. about the minerals like getting iodine and such, which is what really makes the multivalent mama superior. Um, and there's been research that looks at uh, folate and the influence of preeclampsia as well, likely with that methylation vascular function connection. Um, how about some food as medicine for preeclampsia? Um, chocolate is one that we often talk about um, with the connection to magnesium. Um, so that's definitely a recommendation to do some like Hugh Kitchen or Theo's chocolate are two favorites. Um, but yeah, studies have shown and, and linked chocolate consumption with lower blood pressure levels, probably due to the antioxidant function and also um, that magnesium in a, a really rich food form. Um, tart cherry juice is also something that um, has been seen in, in studies. Um, lower levels of melatonin have been linked with preeclampsia. And I think I was actually taking a little bit of supplemental melatonin um, toward the, not the sleep support, but like a liquid form. Mm-hmm. Um, and tart cherry juice could be a, a way to increase that without a supplement. Um, and then garlic is another food that we've talked about in relation to lowering blood pressure as well as beets. Mm-hmm. And I was getting a lot of beets in my farm share, actually. Oh. So we were eating a lot um, throughout the summer. Yeah, beets really will help with that nitric oxide, mm-hmm. which is a vasodilator. So that can help with blood oxygenation, um, also help with blood tone, um, but definitely can lower that uh, hypertension, uh, which would then play a role with the preeclampsia. All yeah. good things. And I love to think of using the... Um, tart cherry juice and gelatin. I think yeah. that's a really yep. nice like evening for anyone, regardless of pregnancy, calm, you know, kind of like evening nightcap kind of thing, especially in the hotter months for sure. Yes. Um, and then adequate protein, I think is another one to really call out again, because you need to maximize that belly space, focusing on protein for, mm-hmm. um, baby's growth and, and all of that, but also, um, for helping to maintain blood pressure and, and prevent preeclampsia protein is super, super important. So getting, you know, 80 plus grams, um, and then, you know, ensuring that you're using high quality salt and not skipping out on salt. Mm -hmm. Um, just making sure that you, you know, pair it with water as well. Right. So both like, even though we look for the protein spilling in the urine, it's not in relationship to necessarily excessive protein intake mm-hmm. could be seen if someone was slamming protein shakes right. or something, but un- that would be more rare. With preeclampsia, it's more of the concern of the catabolism or actually like that mm-hmm. breakdown and the stress from the um, contracting influence of the high blood pressure and the impact on the kidneys. And same with the the sodium element. You know, we always think that well, we've talked about in past episodes just on hypertension alone and connected that high fructose corn syrup is a greater driver. I would add that, you know, really pulling your sugar down Mm -hmm. with preeclampsia. So beyond watching the weight, getting the protein, getting quality mineral salt and the hydration, all that jazz, um, really watching your blood sugar control. Because I know that with gestational diabetes, it's a more known complication as well because of that uh, viscosity of the blood. It gets a lot more oopy goopy when there's a higher sugar content. And we know fructose specifically um, in the high fructose corn syrup can drive up blood pressure as well. Yep. And then last supplement I would call out, um, would be EPA DHA. And that was when I was really vigilant. I think I was taking four a day, yep. um, second and third trimester. Um, and fish oil is actually shown in studies to be more effective than the low dose aspirin, um, that usually is recommended as a solution for preeclampsia. Love it. And, you know, so those omega-3s not only reduce the clotting factor and the influence there, they also are a blood thinner that support baby's brain development with Mm -hmm. the DHA, right? And all of the prostaglandin 
formation, which is basically what drives the inflammatory cascades. So really beneficial. Did you, well, I guess not probably. So you probably were at four a day all the way into the day that yeah, I you did not went to labor. stop, and I, I no bleed outs or anything, right? I had increased bleeding, but it wasn't um, considered a hemorrhage. I did have to have pitocin, um, okay. but it wasn't quite. It was like right on the cusp of like what they used to consider. A, I don't know the classification off the top of my head, but like a mild hemorrhage. It was right on the cusp, um, so they did you know really monitor me, but I didn't have to do transfusion or anything like that. Okay. Um, so yes, in retrospect, I probably would have, um, at least pulled back on like on week that. 39 yeah. to two a day instead yep. of four. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then maybe even held it, you know, if I got to my due date. Yeah. And I know that with my emergency C-section, <laughs> we only had 24 hours mm-hmm. knowing that we were going in. So I at least held for 24 yep. hours, um, knowing that it was um, you know, operation and that in theory you would hold for 48 hours. Exactly. So any, fine. any client that like knows that they're going in for an induction or, um, you know, is that due date or knows they're having any surgery scheduled really, we recommend pulling back on that. Most definitely. And then the relax and regulate, you said you upped as well, mm-hmm. same scenario, like the blood pressure and then the vitamin D balance blend you had just stayed on as a continuum, but potentially someone who's dealing with preeclampsia and taking vitamin D already would want to advocate to get their vitamin D levels yeah. checked to see if appropriate to increase. Totally. Yep. Uh, Cause that's something you could pulse up to, to get it up. Okay. So let's talk about one of the other anxiety factors of birth, uh, group B strep. I know that this is a hot topic that a lot of people want to know about, you know, what natural things can be done. Um, you know, the concerns of IV antibiotics with labor and, you know, what's their research behind that and the actual risk factor associated for baby. Yeah, so around 35 to 37 weeks is when you're going to be screened for group B strep. And this is going to be a vaginal and anal swab. Really fun. You get like this little bonus poke there <laughs> at the end. Um, and group B strep is, is a very common bacteria. It's found in 25% of healthy women. And you're not going to experience any um, symptoms, you know, really at all. I actually, um, back, I don't know what year it was that I did my, my stool test, probably two years prior to, uh, to conceiving. Um, but when I did my stool test, I was positive for group B strep on that. Um, and I looked back at those results during pregnancy just to kind of know my risk factor. Um, and granted that's, you know, one point in time that wasn't um, now necessarily, but I knew that I had that kind of in my system. Um, so I wanted to be even more vigilant about prevention of group B strep. And you had though since that stool test done like three rounds of clinic, oh, yeah. but then you didn't retest. I didn't retest right? because you got pregnant. Yeah, okay, exactly. Um, so you know the concern here with group B strep, if you're positive, you are going to be given IV antibiotics during labor. Um, and depending on you know your midwife situation or home birth, they may have other options. Like I've heard of doing um, a vaginal douche during labor instead, um, but most places are going to be erring on the side of conservative and requiring IV antibiotics. Um, you have to have them in your system at least for four hours, I believe, prior to birthing. So it also means you need to get to your birthing place sooner to be hooked up and get that IV push. Um, it's not a continual IV. I, I asked all these questions because I'm like, I can't picture like laboring with an IV stuck mm-hmm. in me. That's not part of my plan. Um, but that was the concern is, is that I would require IV antibiotics and be in the hospital if I was positive. Um, and really g- group B strep, um, there's some good resources from evidence-based birth and Aviva ROM um, that I'll link. Um, it's a considerably low risk of baby having complications, but babies that do have complications are severe enough that I would have gotten the antibiotics had mm-hmm. I had it. Um, I really wouldn't have had a choice and, and um, you know, the complications can be death. Um, so you really want to be on that. Um, but I was really doing a lot of things in terms of prevention just throughout pregnancy. Um, I was taking both spectrum and targeted strength probiotic throughout. And then I added on, um, ultra fluoro women's during that third trimester. Um, and that's a lactobacillus raminus and L ruteri 
uh, strain that is specific to vaginal health. So often I recommend that for people with like recurring UTIs and yeast Mm -hmm. infections. Yep, exactly. Um, So I added that on and I actually started doing it vaginally as well, probably starting at like 32-ish weeks leading up to that test. Where you were just inserting one capsule at bed and it would just dissolve or... Um, I would do one capsule at bed like every other night and just kind of use a panty liner um, just in case there was any, you know, leakage. Um, But it would dissolve and really no concerns there. Um, And I did start to alternate that with uh, insertion of a clove of garlic. Um, And that's something I had used just historically like for yeast infections back in college. I was like, might as well. It can't, it can't hurt. Um, I haven't seen any studies per se, but I've seen that recommended anecdotally um, by a lot of midwives as well. And when did you start the garlic? Um, probably like 34 weeks. I was doing every other day the, um, the ultra floor women's and then the garlic clove. And okay. So tell me more about the garlic clove. It's a whole clove. <laughs> You peel it, but you don't don't um, smash it. You don't smash it or like really puncture it in any way, shape, or form, and just you know make sure it doesn't have that like end bit that's a little hard mm-hmm. on it. So a freshy clove, or um, you just cut that end off. Yep, yep. Okay. Um, and just insert and again panty liner hook it in out case the it, next yep, day. Hook it out because that's not going to break down like that probiotic no, caps. No, it comes out intact and then intact and then like you feel it all over your body. Like you just like, your smell skin. like oh, yeah. garlic um, all the time. <laughs> yep. Thankfully, my husband uh, doesn't have a great sense of smell. So, <laughs> <laughs> And then, so you were doing the spectrum probiotic, the rebuild mm-hmm. spectrum probiotic one a day? I doubled two? I doubled up on both of those. So at rise and bed. Yep. And same as targeted strength probiotic? Yep. Rise and bed. And then the ultra floor women's inserted every other day and a garlic clove on the every other day. And then also, of course, like we discussed, sugar and refined carbs had already come down. Um, and d- did you do any of like the master tonic um, or uh, any other like oral intake of yeah. antibacterial <laughs> compounds? So I think one thing that led up to my false labor <laughs> incident was I made our um, 40 clove of garlic soup. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to like eat this, literally, you know, make this like twice and eat it for the next two weeks. Um, And I think I even added like extra garlic in it. Um, And I was doing bulbs of of roasted garlic too that I would snack on like with a cheese plate or something like that. Um, So I, like I said, I smelled like garlic both from the vaginal insertion and because I was consuming it. And I think that the day I like kicked myself into that weird early labor situation was more like GI <laughs> cramping from all of the garlic. And I definitely had some like yes. loose stool. Mm-hmm. So just kind of everybody out um, <laughs> experience. But all of the things I did worked because they did test negative yeah. at 37 weeks for group B strep. So I think the the highest recommendations would be just staying on the probiotics and layering on that ultraflora women's if you have concern for group B strep. And I think it would be really appropriate as well. Um, and I don't know if you did this and just left it out or um, didn't, but the GI cleanup, um, you know, we couldn't use and you wouldn't want to use I actually pulsed in berberine at a mm-hmm. period of time during my pregnancy because I had a foodborne illness. And um, my midwife was like, yeah, you know, berberine is safer than an antibiotic at that juncture. So I think if I had tested um, positive uh, at 36 weeks and then they gave me a two-week mm-hmm. window to mm-hmm. test again, I would definitely pulse berberine. Yep. And I would also bring in the GI cleanup for sure. because And you could do that prophylactically because that's a probiotic with that phagocytotic ability to eat away at the gut bacteria and kind of create space. Um, and that would be a really important player, I think, to add in prophylactic. But then the berberine, I would only bring in if testing positive. And you could do two to four a day. I would just double check with your midwife. But you could be a little bit more aggressive going into that tail end. Because, mm-hmm. again, cost a benefit of eradicating the group B. And baby's quite developed at that time. Again, baby's kidneys, liver, right. all that stuff is pretty rock and roll at 37 weeks. So it would be reasonable time to do something like that as an option. And cost benefit too of, you know, IV antibiotics, the baby's going to get all of that too. And and that's going to cause, you know, sterilization of microbiome. So I think the berberine is a way safer, but I don't think I had any, so I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, you hadn't tested positive, so I wouldn't have gotten that aggressive. Yeah. And that's a really good point too, um, just for ladies who are listening. Um, You know, 
if you test positive with group B strep, you can ask for and advocate for getting a retest in, I would say, like you said, give it two weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, But absolutely do that Um, because they say that that test is basically good for a four-week window, which is why they did it at 37 versus 36 for me Mm -hmm. because they thought I was going to go a little later, actually. Um, But you can absolutely advocate for that. They're also screening for group B strep in those urine samples. Um, So if you test positive for it, in that timestamp, that does not preclude IV antibiotics. You still should have the um, vaginal swab, but I've heard of women even like early, you know, second trimester testing positive and then being concerned about going on antibiotics. So make sure that you do double down on these recommendations if you do see that in a urine test as well. Yes. And so let's talk about along that vein as we come to close with today's episode. I know that there were some other food things you did, but I think we could talk about the like spicy food and dates and that stuff in in the delivery story of things you kind of were really ramping up because red the raspberry leaf tea you'd been doing pretty much the whole pregnancy Um, or the second second trimester trimester, and and, um, really the recommendation via Aviva Ram who I follow is as soon as you start second trimester, the midwives at my practice were a little bit more conservative where they were like, let's wait until early third trimester, but I didn't, 24 I totally didn't weeks, wait. 28, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I was just making like a weaker brew. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I made the labor version when I actually was in labor, yes. but we'll talk about that And later. uterine contraction, let's do that. But I want to close with advocating. So yeah. like you were just saying yeah. with group B strep, um, if testing positive, advocating for yourself for a retest, uh, let's talk about advocacy in birth plans. And um, Becky's going to link her birth plan, um, which I think pulls some of the notes from my yeah, birth plan. I used as, yours as a yeah, template. as far as specifics <laughs> of like, I will provide my own music, I will mm-hmm. eat and drink as desired, I will be as mobile as I can. Um, I would like to use a bath in the birthing process. Um, I will have relaxation techniques, which include movements and other comfort measures for natural pain. Um, so identifying, of course, your essential people, um, advocating for the baby never to be removed from Mm -hmm. your room unless, you know, actual medical intervention is requiring. And if so, transferring with your husband or partner during that time. Um, so someone's always accommodating and, and, and present. Um, what were some of the biggest areas where you felt, uh, were important? I know a big element that we both connect on and, and, um, I'm not sure if this is really advocated with Aviva or other midwives, I'm pretty confident is, is less monitoring kind of the better Mm -hmm. because it's usually the iatrogenic or basically the medically induced complications like, Oh, because they're, they're overly fetal monitoring, they're going to take any quote unquote normal sign of duress and be like, Mm -hmm. Oh, we have to, we have to pick things up. Baby's showing a stressed heartbeat. So now we're going to put you on Pitocin. Um, so what are kind of the big priorities in here, Becky? Yeah, that's, that's a huge one. And and for women who have the continuous fetal monitoring, there's a higher rate of C-section because of, of that we see. And it could be that the monitor literally slips off of you. Right. 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 Um, and, and so I wrote my birth plan as if, um, so I used your model and I wrote it as if I was going to be in a place where I had to advocate for all of these things. So that's something to say is, you know, this was more for the hospital than it was the, um, the birthing center because the birthing center already was doing like 95 to 98%, I would say, of the things that I put on my birth plan. So when I gave it to the midwives, and I did that ahead of time, and I think that's something important to do too, is like bring a draft to Mm -hmm. those appointments like 34 weeks on. I was bringing a draft every week and reviewing it with each midwife because I was seen by about four different ones that could have attended my birth. Um, so I would go over it with them and be like, is there anything that's unclear, anything I need to add? And they were like, um, we already do almost all of these, um, the, um, perineal massage, um, Mm -hmm. and, and using oil and warm compresses was something I don't know actually if they do with everyone. Um, but it's something that the nurse picked up on during my birth and was like, okay, I got that. I'll be there. And she did do it. I think. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know she was there with her her olive oil. I know friends and, yeah. that have done yep. that, that that's been game change. Yep. And even like advocating in your birth plan to avoid an episiotomy. Exactly. And allowing natural tear if, if necessary. Um, right. 
uh, avoidance of I know a big thing that you'll talk about was one of the notes in there is when crowning I might request a mirror yeah. to see the progress of my yeah. pushing yeah um which ended they, up being game change for they you, gave right? me a mirror but they brought it out too early they had a mirror and a flashlight before <laughs> there was a head so I was like oh is it happening and they're like no and then you're like I'm <laughs> we're, just we're just ready my vagina yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> This is not pleasant. If you hear Byron describe it, it's like, you could see the vagina pulsating. Like the baby was trying to come out. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> um, but the big ones as far as intervention for mm-hmm. babes. So like I said, we'll, we'll include this, but um, per- delayed cord clamping. Yeah, yeah. Really um, important. And I even did that as a modifiable, as delayed as possible with emergency C-section. Um, and uh, declining the erythromycin yeah. eye ointment. Yeah. Um, so those things they would have done in the birth center, um, the erythromycin um, eye ointment they offered, and we had to actually sign off on something ahead of time that we didn't want it. Um, and then the vitamin K shot also um, is something that I would definitely, you know, look into and do your own research on what you're comfortable with. Um, some people do vitamin K drops for babe. Um, instead of the shot, but there's just not a ton of research yeah, I haven't seen solid that research I could find. Um, so I just advocated for a preservative free version and asked to be shown the label before it was given. Um, and then the placenta encapsulation was the other thing that I think, you know, was something that could go either way. And I wanted to make sure was on my birth plan that we knew that we were keeping the placenta. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the vitamin K shot, I ended up bringing my own to the mm-hmm. hospital, which worked out fine too. And then in my birth plan, modified that my midwife would administer it. Um, and they allowed her to do that. She came in the um, surgical you know, suite and was there the whole process. So that worked all right. Um, and then of course, based on the times, um, having quite large yeah. up top, I do not consent to COVID-19 uh-huh. testing because what we've heard, and and this is the sentence, in the event of, in the event COVID-19 is confirmed or suspected, I do not consent to separation of my baby and plan to breastfeed for baby to remain in my care while in the hospital per current recommendations of CDC, WHO, AAP, and ACOG. Um, and so having that like highlighted, having mm. a pocket of your birth plan in your husband's jeans and your birth bag yep, everywhere. Your, yeah. <laughs> because you just never know what happens in the transfer uh-huh. and you don't want to find yourself locked into an arbitrary policy that you haven't already advocated or denied or sh- demonstrated a lack of consent. Um, and so that's really important. And, and throughout the birth plan is like conscious, um, you know, consideration of consent. I'd like to be informed. I'd like to have conversations about what's happening. Um, because unfortunately it just becomes, we know the, the, the business of birthing, mm-hmm. it just becomes too algorithmic, um, and too mechanical and not as organic and synergistic of an experience as it could be. Um, especially for those of you that may not have access to midwife care um, or, you know, are, are within the hospital environment, these birth plans can be utilized in any aspect of care. The most important element is that you are confident in your self-advocacy and you and your partner are on board and have this in writing. So we will send also a blog from Evidence-Based Birth on birthing during the time of COVID-19, yep. which will help to provide you some of those statements. And um, I think that that wraps up today's episode. I think we got a lot. I think we sure did. Um, we'll also <laughs> share with you the lactation cookies oh, yeah. that Becky actually, I think you made those when I was pre- when I was breastfeeding, uh-huh. um, as well as the No Bake uh, Berries SD Boost Nut Balls, which both come in fantastic, of course, postpartum. Yep. Um, and uh, we'll send you guys also some links on our recent YouTube videos all about bone broth. As y'all have heard, that you know that's one of the most natural ways to support the electrolyte stability while getting that connective tissue and that mellow out brain space that we all are looking to achieve in the evening. Um, so any closing thoughts, Becky? <laughs> um, yeah, third trimester seems like ages ago. And I would say, again, focus is just, you know, preparation for birth, making sure that your, you know, birth bag and, and your plan are done like a few weeks ahead, at least of your due date, really important. Um, and then starting to stock your freezer when you're like bored and <laughs> like itching yeah. to do something and not sleeping super well and feeling super antsy and not wanting to sit down. That's probably time to start like making the bone broth and the lactation cookies and 
stocking up your freezer for postpartum. Yeah. And I like your note of um, once a week date nights. I think super oh, important. Yeah. Well, yeah. While the time exists and the silent space is there, even though you might not feel like putting on makeup uh-huh. or going out, I think that that's we, a really good recommendation. We did it every week. We even, I think, had some <laughs> advanced plans that we never like got around to of you know, what we were going to do if I went until 42 weeks. <laughs> yeah. And I would say also as someone who, uh, you know, mourned the loss of a natural birth, uh, put all your plans together, advocate for yourself for sure, but be prepared to oh, yeah. tear it all up and burn yep. it all down yep. and, um, let God make the plans. And, um, you know, everything works out in the way it needs to be when you have a beautiful, healthy baby at the end of the story. So you just give me goosebumps. I love it. <laughs> All right. Till next week. Um, also, if you're loving the podcast, make sure you go on over to where you're listening. Leave us a five star review, a little sentence or two of why you love it. Um, and again, call to action to check out the YouTube channel, Naturally Nourished. Check out the entire gut series. And um, we will be continuing to build on our fasting and keto series as we turn the calendar into the new year. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Naturally Nourished podcast. Visit our blog at AllieMillerRD.com for recipes, wellness tips, and food as medicine meal plans. Connect with Allie and Becky at Allie Miller RD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, stay nourished and be well.